Pope Benedict XVI described his new book, Jesus of Nazareth, as my personal search for the face of the Lord. What are the results of that search? And what do they tell us about the face of Jesus? Join us as we discuss those questions with Dr. Brant Petrie, Professor of Biblical Theology at Our Lady of the Holy Cross College in New Orleans. I'm Father Michael Scanlon, Chancellor of Franciscan University of Steubenville, Ohio, and you're watching Franciscan University Presents. Stay with us. Talking about Pope Benedict XVI and Jesus of Nazareth, his book, his whole understanding of Jesus of Nazareth, which is unique and something that I think surprised a lot of people when he came out with it so quickly uh, in his pontificate. We have a regular panelist here, Dr. Regis Martin, professor of systematic theology here at Franciscan University, and Dr. Scott Hahn, professor of biblical theology here at the university. And we've got a special guest for this round, Dr. Brant Petrie. And he is the Donum Dei Professor of Word and Sacrament at Our Lady of Holy Cross College in New Orleans, Louisiana. That's a long title, but, uh, but in any case, you're theological yes. <laughs> in the you. approach. You received your PhD in theology from the University of Notre Dame where you specialize in the study of New Testament and ancient Judaism, and that's excellent for today. And you're the author of Jesus, the Tribulation and the End of the Exile, and you're currently working on a book on Jesus and the Jewish roots of the Eucharist. Yes. I will like that. In recent months, you've written and spoken widely on Pope Benedict's book, Jesus of Nazareth, and that's the topic, and that's what we want to pursue today. And um, so we're going to start with your telling us what's the story behind this book? What led the Holy Father to feel the need to write this particular book so early in his pontificate? And uh, it was unusual. Yeah. Uh, the, in the preface to the book, in the introduction, uh, Benedict says that the book has had a long gestation. He basically yeah. takes the story of the origin of the book all the way back to his own studies in the 1930s and 1940s, when there were a number of books that were written on Jesus of Nazareth by men like Carl Adam and Romano Guardini and others, all of which portrayed Christ both in human and divine terms, who saw in him both the, a son of man and the son of God, the eternal word made flesh. But then he, he goes on to tell his own story about how in the 1950s this uh, wedge began to be driven between the so-called historical Jesus, the, the man Jesus who really lived and walked among us, and the Christ of faith. And that he says that this wedge eventually led to, in many circles, uh, the two falling apart, really, the, the historical Jesus falling apart from the Christ of faith and leading to a division. And many, many scholars have basically come to the conclusion in the 1950s, 60s, and the 70s and 80s, it got really bad, uh, led to the conclusion that the Gospels really do not give us access to the true historical Jesus, the Jesus of history, the man Jesus of Nazareth, but that they only portray the Christ of faith, a kind of uh, portrait painted by the apostles, but not really true to history, painted by the evangelists, not necessarily true to history. And Benedict feels at the beginning of the book, he points out that this has put faith in a very precarious situation, faith in the person of Jesus. I think he even says the words, he says that this situation, which has now begun to influence not just scholars and, and yeah. people doing graduate work in New Testament studies, but the Christian faithful at large who have heard about this wedge between the historical Jesus and the Christ of faith through uh, television shows, documentaries, say on the Discovery Channel or whatnot, that this kind of dichotomy has now trickled down to the faithful. And he is, he's concerned 
that it has put our faith in the person of Christ in jeopardy. So, so he's trying to really put down an anchor. Yes, he, so in the midst of all this, of where the truth is, and he says, I trust the gospel. This is the radical yeah. statement that has caused so much of a stir in scholarly circles. <laughs> it, seems, it seems laughable to the faithful. Of course, the faithful have always trusted the gospels. Yeah. But Benedict recognizes that in the modern period, there is a growing skepticism and an agnosticism which can even affect the faithful. And he wants to tell them, he wants to let them know that he, as the Holy Father and as a great scholar and theologian, trust the Gospels. That's his approach in this book. Um, throughout much of the 20th century, there was what we might call a hermeneutic or an interpretive okay. posture of suspicion, of skepticism. And what Benedict is showing us in this book is a hermeneutic of trust, a hermeneutic of faith in the Gospels. He describes also how he began back in 2003, mm -hmm. two years before he became Pope Benedict. And so this was sort of the crowning achievement of his own scholarly and pastoral work for decades. And so he finished the first four chapters before he became Pope Benedict. And you'd think, well, he's going to lay it aside. But no, if anything, he applied himself even more assiduously after becoming Pope Benedict in the evenings and vacations and every says spare in hour. The, in the beginning there, I used all of my free time yes. to write this right. book. Yep. I'm saying yep. myself, I've never used all of my free time. <laughs> well, this, this confirms, <laughs> I like think, this. the sense that he has that this is going to be his legacy, not as an academician and not simply as an ecclesiocrat, some kind of church official. This is going to be, I think, for Pope Benedict, what the theology of the body was for Pope John Paul II. It is going to be a permanent contribution to the church that isn't something innovative or cleverly new, but it really represents the distillation of everything that came before it in a fresh new way that is going to reinvigorate the scriptures for countless Catholics and non-Catholics too. Isn't that maybe a, a touch too optimistic? I'm, I'm wondering, is it enough uh, what he's done, even with all of his vaunted uh, scholarship? Can we overcome this crisis of, of disbelief? I mean, for about 1,500 years, nobody asked, what is the truth concerning Jesus? Because Jesus is the truth. I mean, that hermeneutic, I think, had endured. Now it's been supplanted by suspicion. Yeah, I, well, I'm very optimistic, actually. Although it is true that, what, and it's important for everyone to remember that what he's given us here is the first half of That's a right. two-volume work. There's much more to come. He hasn't yet taken us to the upper room and to the passion and the death and the resurrection. And, and to that extent, I think the impact of the book is going to be slightly lessened until we see the full picture that he is going to paint for us of Jesus and Nazareth. I mean, it, it un, undeniably, it will have a scholarly impact. Uh, well, but in, in terms of a popular splash, now, now that it's going to be in two volumes, that makes it even less likely well, actually, people will read it. I the actually wonder, around. the. I think it might be the other way around, yeah. because the scholarly reaction to it has been quite negative in many circles. There was one review I was reading which was just aghast at the fact that the Pope trusted the Gospels yeah. and believed in the divinity of Christ. I mean, how could the Pope believe in the divinity of Christ? And I'm reading the review thinking, how could he not? I would, why would you even be surprised? That's how high the level of skepticism is in the scholarly world. But the faithful that I've encountered, yeah. lay people and interested and educated and impassioned lay readers who have encountered the book have said, this has drawn me into prayer. This has drawn me into a deeper relationship with Christ. So I will be interested to see. I think it may actually have more of an impact because he's such a clear right, and a profound right. writer. Yeah. He takes you deep, but he does it with such clarity and such, I such might, lucidity. I might add a third class, too, because I think you're right about the scholars. Mm -hmm. They look at this and they treat it patronizingly. Mm -hmm. You know, even those who are sympathetic, you know, we can think of, of one review in particular whose review, I, will, I won't name him, but he was very condescending. Uh, I think largely due to the fact that, that, that Pope Benedict didn't cite his work. But uh, <laughs> yeah. the lay people are excited about it. They're working through it. It's not easy, but it's, it's right. accessible. Right. Yeah. And not only can you access it, but you will find almost every time you've finished four or five pages, prayer is deepened. But the clergy are the ones that I am finding almost consistent, without exception, seminarians, deacons, and especially priests who for whatever reason, busyness, seminary training that left them big gaps in their own scriptural formation, they're the ones who are telling me that this is changing the way I read and preach the Gospels wow. yeah. well, and one, pray. Yeah, well, one thing strikes me about this book is you, you can't fit it into the typical genre of papal literature. It, it reminds me of Crossing the Threshold of Hope, mm. but a very different sort of book. Also because John Paul II began that book as Pope, this was begun clearly yeah. 
Yes. Back in the 30s, that's when the gestation uh, took hold. But it's a different kind of text. Is it magisterial? No, it, uh, it most definitely is not magisterial. The Pope actually says this at the beginning. He says, I want this to be clear to everyone that this is not um, a product of the teaching magisterium. He says, it is my personal search yeah. for the face of the Lord. Well, and he's yeah. using names of philosophers yeah. and theologians in and famous Europe exegetes. and James, yeah. and, but some of them that uh, even semi-intellectuals like myself never heard of before. You know, I mean, they're just surprising names and they're not necessarily Christian, you know, in no. their points right. of view and right. theories on things and it keeps your mind at work. It does, but this is, I think one of the things that has baffled people about the book is that it really doesn't fit any category or at least the kind of fractured categories that dominate modern scholarship. He, he's a man of immense learning and intelligence. That's why it's so astonishing that intellectuals would dismiss him, speak patronizingly about him. I want to bring this back to the comparison with John Paul though because when you first got the, uh, the, the first edition of The Theology of the Body was based upon the Wednesday audiences. Yeah. Yes. And then when Dr. Mikhail Waldstein put together yeah. the second edition, it was much longer yeah. and it was based upon not the Wednesday audiences which were hastily and sometimes sloppily translated in, you know, in a week, but a manuscript that he found in Polish because John Paul had finished The Theology yeah. of the Body right before becoming John That's Paul. Right. Uh, and so this too was not an infallible utterance yeah. of the magisterium, yeah. Yeah. but the distillation of a lifetime of learning that God and his merciful right. providence right. brought to the chair of yeah. Peter yeah. to kind of illuminate the church's teaching about the natural law, but even more the mystery of the person and the hinge, you know, sexuality. Right. And so, you know, it took five, 10, 15, maybe even 20 years for the church to receive this and realize yeah. What a breakthrough. Right. I wouldn't be surprised if the same kind of thing happens when the second volume is done. It's going to take time to assimilate this, maybe decades. In, in, in both cases, these men have spoken the word. Uh, what they say signifies something true about human sexuality and now about the scriptures. Right, and I, I don't expect a tidal wave of chastity to overcome right. the world right. yes. or the yeah. church with yeah. the theology yeah. of the body. Yeah. I, don't, I don't expect a tidal wave of spiritual exegesis to overcome the academy right. either. Right. But, but a new I, generation is going to be raised up and formed. Yeah, I think he has given uh, to a lot of young scholars like myself exactly. the confidence to ask yeah. the question again, is the skepticism of the modern age toward the Gospels justified? Is it reasonable? Is it even plausible? Right. And what he's showing us in this book is that the Jesus of the Gospels, the Jesus of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John is the most plausible, the real Jesus. He's the one that the church has always proclaimed. He is the historical Jesus and he's right. the one we, right. we can And the kingdom of this. God, how, do, how does the Pope <laughs> present the kingdom of God that has that oh. freshness to it? <laughs> how much time do we have? Um, <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, that's a what, huge yeah, theme. Yeah, that really is a huge theme. And in the book, he spends a whole chapter laying it out that really that the Jesus' proclamation of the kingdom is at the heart of his message. And what Benedict does in this book with the meaning of the kingdom is really what he does in the whole book. He tries to show throughout the book that all of Jesus' teachings, the Beatitudes, the parables, mm -hmm. the kingdom of God are in many ways self-reflexive. They're Christological. Right, They're illuminating yeah. something to us about the mystery of who Jesus is. Mm -hmm. And what Benedict shows in this book, going all the way back to Origen, mm -hmm. is that Jesus is what Origen said, uh, the auto basileia, the kingdom in person. Right. And, and that's really Which would be an insufferable statement in the absence of faith. Unless it were true, that's this right. would be just intolerable Absolutely. to assert himself like that. The, I, the kingdom is in your midst. I am uh, yes. the, the enshrinement, the embodiment of the kingdom. This is he, the scandal of the incarnation. Right. It's a scandal yeah. of particularity. The kingdom of God is in your midst in Luke yeah. 17, yeah. 21. Yeah. And he's referring to yeah. Who can endure himself? that? Who can he he, himself he himself. also goes on to develop a second and a third level of meaning. That's Build right. on the foundation of Otto Basileia, Jesus is the kingdom himself. He speaks of the interiority right. and how the Holy Spirit, how Jesus brings about a radical interiority so that the kingdom of God can be established within us. But the third level yes. is an externalization. It's the ecclesial expression that the church in so many ways is the mystery, the embodiment of the kingdom. The body of Christ is the body of the king. Yeah. 
And it's a beautiful treatment. It's so balanced. And, yeah, the uh, extension, the prolongation of that very mystery of presence. That's right. The church is the kingdom present in mystery. And what Benedict shows throughout the book, in particular in the wonderful section on the parables, yeah. about how the parables both reveal the mystery of Christ and the mystery of the kingdom. They're both Christological parables and ecclesiological. You know, I, I was really fetched by that comment you made earlier that a book like this provides an impetus for young scholars like yourself. To go, to go forward, to be confident yeah, that absolutely. reason and faith can somehow get wedded together That's, once more. That is exactly what he's doing. He's taking up what John Paul did in Fides et Ratio on faith and reason, but he's doing it with regard to the scriptures, yeah. that we need to approach the gospels, approach the scriptures through the eyes of both faith and reason. And we'll see that when we do it with those two wings, biblical scholarship right, is we'll really going to take, take off. It's going to really yeah. well, take off. Well, when we come back, we want to apply that to the special way that the Pope handles Jesus teaching and preparing his disciples. The personal ministry, yeah. not general to the crowd, that it's really unique and their distinctions need to be made and we can find ourselves in them, so stay with us. The Pope's treatment of the parable of the rich young ruler really impressed me. Uh, of course, we know that story. The rich young ruler comes to Jesus, asks him, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, obey the commandments. He says, what else must I do? And Jesus says, uh, give all that you have to the poor and come follow me. We don't realize the full implications of that as American readers, but a theologically astute Jew in the ancient world would realize that by asking the rich young ruler to devote his life completely to himself, that is to Jesus, Jesus was putting himself on the level of the Torah, the Word of God, or even of God himself, because those were the only two things to which a pious Jew in the ancient world would devote himself wholly. The professors are constantly bringing in God to their subjects, no matter what it is, not because they have to or they're trying to force it, it's because he naturally works in everything that we're learning about. I'm a biology major, and it's hard, <laughs> it's really tough. But anything biology, muscle, body is cool to me. So learning about the body and the way that the body works and knowing that, that there's a God behind it all is just absolutely amazing to me and beautiful. Franciscan University is academically challenging and passionately Catholic. Talking about Pope Benedict XVI, his book, his whole understanding of Jesus of Nazareth. And we have a special guest, Dr. Brant Petrie. And uh, as we move into the development uh, that the Pope takes us through in the meaning of Jesus' his life, his leading and developing and relating to the disciples, um, Let's start with the meaning of Jesus' baptism in the Jordan wow. and, uh, and his temptation in the wilderness. Why are these so significant from the Pope's point of view, and why do they lead then to his work with his disciples? Oh, this <clears throat> Benedict's treatment of the baptism and temptation of Jesus is one of my favorite parts of the book. Um, because what he does, and this is one of the real gifts of the book, what, what he does when he looks at the meaning of Jesus' baptism is he asks the question, what is it hearkening back to in the Old Testament? And then what is it pointing forward to? Benedict really does an amazing job of unlocking the mystery, in particular of Jesus' baptism. We'll start there. What, what, what Benedict shows is that Jesus comes into the world not simply to bring the kingdom of God, not simply to inaugurate the kingdom, yeah. but also to inaugurate this expectation that the Jews had of a new exodus. We all remember the exodus from Egypt, right, with Moses leading the 12 tribes of Israel out of the land of Egypt and through the waters of the Red Sea. What Benedict shows is that Christ, in his baptism, is embodying in himself a new exodus, inaugurating a new exodus yeah. by entering, going down into the waters of the Jordan, and then coming up into the promised land. And uh, it's, so it's fascinating. He shows that we all have asked this question before, for example, and John asked it very readily right in Matthew chapter 3. I need to be baptized by you, he says to Christ. Yes. Why do you come to me? All and right. Jesus says, but it must be so in order to fulfill all righteousness. And whenever you see Jesus using this language yeah. fulfillment, you have to ask, what in the Old Testament 
is he speaking of? And Benedict shows here that what he's speaking of is this new exodus, of fulfilling an exodus in himself and inaugurating it through his baptism. At the other, on the other hand, however, Benedict also shows that the, the baptism of Christ doesn't simply point backward to the exodus of Israel and their entry into the promised land. It also points forward to the cross. Yeah. It points forward to the cross. Um, it's one of the strange things in the gospel that Jesus speaks of his own passion and death as a baptism. We think yes. here about the famous yes. scene with James and John. They want to sit at the right, right and left hand of Christ in the kingdom. And Jesus says, you don't know what you're asking. Can you be baptized with the baptism with which I will be baptized? Yeah. Now, that seems such a strange image for him to use. But what Benedict shows in the book is that Christ's entry into the waters of baptism which remember was in John's day a mm. baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. Well, Christ himself is in no need of a baptism of repentance right. for the remission of sins. But what he does, what Benedict shows is that he endures that baptism for our mm. sake. He enters into the mystery of suffering and sin and he takes that upon himself as an anticipation of what he is going to accomplish on the cross. And that's when the real new exodus will occur. And he will not simply set us free from the land of Egypt or from Israel, or, I mean from Egypt or slavery or servitude, but he'll set us free from sin, he'll set us free from death. This, this forever debunks the common interpretation of the adoptionists who say that at the baptism, Jesus suddenly discovered himself. Wow, yeah. I'm the son of God, I'm the Messiah, I guess I've been anointed, so I am. You know, Pope Benedict explains that this is not any news to Jesus. This is a public investiture so that everybody knows who he is and why he's come. So it isn't as though the water sanctifies Jesus. It's that Jesus now sanctifies the water of Old Testament cleansing, transforming it into not only baptismal water, but the very means by which Christ confers upon us his own divine sonship. The voice from heaven confirms that this is not anything new for him, but through him it will become something radically new for us. No. It, it, it bespeaks, I, I think, uh, uh, the extent of his kenosis, uh, the depth of the descent yes. that he has freely undertaken in order to rid the world of, of, of sin. He plunges uh, into a, a foreshadowing of his own death, the horror of the cross, followed by the silence and the shame of Sheol, this, this profound, abysmal descent in, into hell. He shoulders our sin. He carries our guilt with him right to the bottom of that river. And then he emerges triumphant. This is, this is a kind of foreshadowing of his, his own resurrection. I am the, the true Jonah. You've pitched me overboard, uh, and I've, I've been swallowed up, and now I swallow follow up, the whole bloody whale. That's one of the beautiful things about the book is he shows how Christ not only fulfills, I'm thinking here what you just said about the new Jonah, Christ fulfills all of the major figures of the Old Testament in himself. He's not simply the new Moses who's going to inaugurate this new exodus as a Messiah. He's also the new Jonah who is immersed in the waters of death and then emerges from them in, to bring us new life. But he's also the new Israel who passes through the waters of the Red Sea and into the desert, as this leads us to the temptation, but then also passes through the waters of the Jordan into the Promised Land. He's basically taking all of the, all of the threads, all of the strands of the Old Testament, fulfilling them, summing them up in himself, and not simply recapitulating what happened in the Old Testament, but anticipating what he's going to accomplish in the cross. And he's entirely in charge right Absolutely. from the beginning. Absolutely. I mean, from all eternity, he's flooded with this consciousness of being the Son, the but Savior. You know, the thing about all this that as we accept all this, it seems to distance Jesus. Uh, he's the whole new Old Testament fulfillment, the New Testament. This seems too much, overwhelming. Who could possibly stay with him and understand it? And yet he turns to the 12 disciples. Well, he chooses and, the 12, yeah. and even as they're looking around at each other and realizing, let's see, 9, 10, 11, 12, uh -huh. you know, he points out this is not a coincidence either. <laughs> they recognize right. that they are called to participate in this new exodus, in this new Israel, the 12 tribes. You'll sit on thrones and judge the, the, the 12 tribes. They recognize that, that the very divine mission of Jesus is now something in which they participate fully. And just as Moses chose 12 and then 70, Jesus chooses 12 right, and then yeah. 70. And so many of these parallels, I think, indicate not only the rich 
and the, and the depth of uh, our participation, but how much preparation went into this that you can't really grasp the new without spending a little bit more time in the old. And it isn't as though Jesus yeah. is simply going back to the old and finding a parallel here and there, here a type, there a type, you know. No, it's, it's as though the, the pure light of his divine sonship hits the prism of the scriptures and in the Old Testament refracts these rays so that all of the colors that you find, uh -huh. all of the a aspects of the ages of the Old Covenant anticipate this great so revelation. how can this group of fishermen understand that stuff and begin <laughs> well, to grasp the it? Well, <laughs> not without the power of the Holy Spirit, that's, that's correct. For sure. But however, I would r suggest that because they are Jews and they've heard the scriptures, yes, they've been taught the scriptures true. since their childhood, any first century Jew would have recognized that when Jesus comes on the scene and he gathers around him men that he calls the twelve, yeah. that something special is going on here. Yeah. Because the Jews would have known, especially in the first century, that the ten tribes of Israel in the Assyrian exile back in 722 B.C. had been scattered to the four winds yeah. and that they were still waiting for the Messiah to come and regather Israel. So the, the salvation that Jesus comes to bring is not something he's going to accomplish merely on his own, although he'll be able to do it all on right, it, through his right. own power. He's going to call the disciples. He's saying to them, I am the new Israel, right. but you are going to be participating in the new Israel as well. You are going to be gathered in and brought into this mission of inaugurating yeah, the kingdom. You know, it, it's not as if they go looking for him because no. Jesus no. takes the initiative and finds them. You did not choose me. Right. I chose I mean, you. you know, the rabbinic me. tradition was you look for a rabbi, a school, you organize around the Torah. Yeah. But here's a guy that, that organizes everything. He's the centerpiece. And he moves towards this mysterious hour, which is the great theme of the Joannine uh, testimony, the hour of his death, the hour of the glorification of God. And it's not as though they got it the first day or the first semester, you know. <laughs> right. You have to go through 16 chapters of Matthew before finally one of them gets yeah, it. You know, yeah. you are the Christ, you are the Son of the living God, well then you are rock. Well, you know? the school of Jesus is everlasting. I mean, we never become rabbis. Mm. We're always pupils. No, we're always disciples and it's important to point out that in Greek the word mathetes means students. Yeah. Right? That's what the disciples the are. They're students. Yeah. They are following their master, their rabbi, and he's teaching them, leading them ever deeper into the mysteries of the things that he's come to accomplish. And yet Peter j seems to jump up ahead in, in <laughs> announcing and discovering this thing. Uh, uh, he, he's first in the class? He is. He is absolutely and, first in the class. But he's not treated like a whiz kid either. No, you know, no. Jesus does say flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. Yeah, right. It's not just because you're more, more intelligent than the other 11. Right, right. My father who is in heaven, you know. I mean, he's sort of a dunce, uh, really, and, and then a delinquent. I mean, he, he betrays right. Jesus, denies him. He's impulsive and says, look, you're not going to have to suffer. And Jesus calls him Satan. This is the first pope. Yes. That's pretty this awesome. This is why I identify <laughs> with him, because he's yeah. a dunce. And we can all identify yes. with we can Peter. All identify with Peter, but it is it is important to recognize, as as Scott was saying, that the real entry into the, his his headship as uh, over the disciples of being the. the the first among the twelve, is when he receives that revelation. And Christ says to him, who do you say, who do, yeah. who do men say that the right. Son of Man is? And this is an important question. That question has resounded throughout the centuries. Yes. Who do people say that Christ is? Right. You go to the bookstore these days, go look in the religion section. Right. There's a host of opinions, a host of competing, right. yeah. contradictory opinions about who Jesus, the Son of Man, is. And what Benedict is giving us yeah. in this book is in many ways just a deeper elucidation of the fir very first All you have to do is, is go to the publishing house that produced this book. That's right. I mean, they're also <laughs> turning out the Da Vinci Code. That's right. So we've got oh, Benedict yeah. and Scott yeah. Hahn yeah. on one side <laughs> and this brown. Well, that's a microcosm, I suppose, <laughs> of the world in which we live. Yeah. Yeah. But I think we also recognize that what he's doing is not only addressing the world and the church, but the, 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 the scholars, because the vast majority of scholars, Catholic as well as Protestant, would take a text like Matthew 16, the, 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 the you know, you are Peter, and say, well, this didn't necessarily actually happen. This is not the Jesus of history. This is the Christ of faith. This did not happen before the cross. This is the church sort of projecting back into, you know, the pre-resurrection Jesus, these sayings. But what he does is respectfully uh, quotes these scholars who debunk this, and then he debunks the debunkers. I mean, he just shows that actually the text makes much yeah. more sense on its own terms right. if you see Jesus yeah. and Peter in a real dialogue. And, and they, if you put them what, in their first century context also. Yeah, yeah. and parables. 
Yes. That he's used parables here, Jesus has to teach that they can both understand and not yet really understand. Yeah. That, that it can mm -hmm. escape them, teach something, but be beyond them at the same time. He, uh, you know, I, the thing that really impressed uh, uh, Ratzinger about Guardini, for example, who mm -hmm. helped shape the horizon of his, his theology, was this attentive listening to the text. Listen to the word. Don't master the word. Let the word master you. Simply submit to the otherness of God who shows himself in this man, a kind of docility. D don't, don't try to straitjacket yourself within these categories of modernity, but simply listen. Listen to what the Gospels are saying. And don't Trust. be afraid to ask questions either. Right. Guardini was a master at that. That's right. Asking the right questions that the text yeah. would elicit. Yeah. I think that's what he's showing us in the book. You're right, that here he is, right, the head of the universal church, and the way he approaches the Gospels is like a little child. Yeah. You don't master the Gospels. You don't yeah. master the Bible. The Bible masters you. And yeah. when you submit to it and approach it through this hermeneutic of faith, that is using reason, bringing all of his intellectual capacities to bear, then yeah. he begins to shed light, not just on the mystery of the disciples, but as Father was talking about, the mystery of the parables. I would encourage everyone in particular to go and look yeah. at the section on the parables yeah. when he treats the Good Samaritan and he treats the yeah. prodigal son. His, his study of those is so beautiful. Yeah. And I think you're right. You get the sense as you're reading the book that this isn't something he's just writing up as an academic work. He's been listening to these Gospels for decades and decades as a priest, as a bishop, and now as the Holy Father. And this is really the fruit of his, not only of his intellectual life, but of his life of prayer, of submitting and listening to the text yeah. and taking it seriously. Well, when we come back, we're going to deal with Jesus' self-understanding, not just what everybody else is saying in analysis, but how does he understand himself and project that? Stay with us. All the key moments of Christ's life, Benedict says, are Christ in prayer, Christ's relation to the Father. Um, that's how he shows that he's son by his communication with the Father. Before he is tempted in the wilderness, he's in prayer. Uh, the quintessential moment is the Garden of Gethsemane, where through his prayer, he gets courage to fulfill his mission. As Christians, we can look on Christ and see that the way to being in constant relation to the Father is constant prayer so we can have courage to fulfill our Christian mission. It's great to see that the mission of Franciscan is reflected in uh, the academic pursuits of its students. I am uh, I'm double majoring in uh, theology and mathematics. It just helps because in math you can see causality, uh, chain of thinking and things in the material realm that can be applied to the spiritual. Everyone here really wants to be a saint. You know, there's just no better place to grow uh, in my manhood, to grow in my faith, and to grow in my intellect. Franciscan University is academically challenging and passionately Catholic. We're here talking about Jesus of Nazareth, but we're talking about that subject as presented by Pope Benedict XVI in his surprising book, which is challenging scholars and preachers and all sorts of people uh, to understand his approach and what he's adding to our understanding. We're here at Franciscan University, uh, surrounded by our students working all the equipment with our regular panelists in tow and with our special guest, Dr. Brant Petrie. Uh, and we're moving now into what Pope Benedict tells us about Jesus' self-understanding, something that has been a matter of great speculation by theologians, philosophers, and any, and any kind of columnists over the time. So where does it get anchored down better through uh, the Pope's analysis? The, the Pope's here? analysis is fascinating on this point. Throughout much of the 20th century, there was a lot of speculation. Again, the kind of general, general current of skepticism with regard to these two questions. Did Jesus know he was the Messiah? And did he know he was the divine Son of God? And there were many negative answers to these questions by a lot of the skeptical scholars. But what Benedict shows in this book 
is that if you read the Gospels closely and carefully, and in particular in light of their first century Jewish perspective, it is absolutely abundantly clear that Jesus understood himself to be not simply the Messiah of Israel, but the divine Son of God. I'm thinking in particular here, one of the most beautiful parts of the book, one of the most powerful, is when uh, Pope Benedict uses the work of Rabbi Jacob Neusner, mm -hmm. who wrote a book called A Rabbi Talks with Jesus. And in this book, Rabbi Jacob Neusner, who's one of the great modern scholars of, of Judaism, uh, imagines himself uh, listening to Jesus at the Sermon on the Mount and listening to this new Torah, this new law that Jesus was teaching to his disciples. And after hearing the Sermon on the Mount, Rabbi Neusner enters into a kind of imaginary dialogue. He imagines himself going back to the rabbi of his local town and talking about with him about what he had just heard Jesus say. And the rabbi, uh, in his mind, asked Jacob Neusner, well, what did Jesus add? I mean, what did he take away from the Torah? What did he leave out yeah. from the Jewish law? And he says, nothing. He left nothing wow. out. But then the rabbi says, well, what did he add? And Rabbi Neusner said, he added only one thing, himself. Huh. Himself. And this was the great turning wow. point for Rabbi Neusner, because in his book he says, I can't accept this because it suggests that if he adds only himself, to the Torah, to the law, that he is and somehow above the law. Yeah. He's the embodiment of the law. And there's only one person who could be that, and that is Yahweh right. himself. Wow. It could God himself. Yeah. And so, in other words, what Benedict shows is wow. even using the work of Jewish scholars who have read the Gospels carefully, who take them seriously and historically, it is absolutely abundantly clear that Jesus understood himself to be the Torah made flesh, the Word in person the one who has come to bring the Messianic Torah to the people of Israel and to the Gentiles. And that when he uses words in terms such as uh, referring to himself as the Son of Man or the Lord of the Sabbath, these were Jewish categories taken from the Old Testament that pointed to, for example, in one case with the Son of Man, the heavenly Son of Man coming on the clouds in Daniel 7, and in another case, the Lord of the Sabbath. I mean, think about this for a first century Jew. <laughs> who is the Lord of the Sabbath? Right. Yeah. It could only be Yahweh, the Lord of creation, the right. one who inaugurated the Sabbath, who sanctified yeah. the Sabbath. And so in this book, Rabbi Neusner's book, uh, Rabbi Talks with Jesus, yeah. he says, I recognize that this Jesus is very Jewish, right. but I can't follow him because he's claiming to be something more than a mere Jew. Right. And he's Pope claiming Benedict, to be God. And wow. Pope Benedict engages Rabbi Neusner yeah. more than all the other scholars. Yes. It's yeah. a fascinating kind of exchange that isn't just abstract. They've actually met in person. They've corresponded. They have a real friendship going back and forth. And so this is the lived context in which the book is written. And what it does, I think, is especially useful for scholars and seminarians and students who are taking courses in Scripture because the tendency has been way too often to say, well, you've got to begin with reason and only add the faith later on. But if you begin reading the New Testament in light of the Old, you recognize that first century Jews weren't 19th century rationalists. No. <laughs> they were men and women of faith, and they also used their reason. And so when Jesus has prepared his people for the coming, and when he actually enters into their midst, the marriage of faith and reason is a lived experience that suddenly welcomes someone far greater than their expectations were. Yeah, I, I guess for the rabbi to make that leap of faith, would require some movement of grace. Absolutely. And it's not yet forthcoming. But the fact that he would inquire with such honesty and integrity about this, uh, I, I think, uh, commends him. Uh, it's very to striking. Us. I, I think it's very telling that you find Ra Rabbi Neusner, who's one of the greatest Jewish yeah. scholars of the yeah. 20th century, taking the gospel seriously, right, historically. Right, right, yeah. I mean, you think if anyone would know, he would know. Yeah. And he, he does take them very seriously. He doesn't read them with the kind of skepticism that we've seen. In but, but in the end, uh, the, the, the argument founders on doubt. It does. Uh, whereas for the Catholic, wonder. Uh, that's right. You know, the, the sense of amazement that here is a tale that, that, that we would rather have true than any other that man might tell. That's right. It seems too good to be true, yeah, except right. that it is. Yeah, right. except that but of it course, is. you got the flip-flop situation, the Christian who doesn't think the Old Testament has anything to do with uh, the New Testament. Right. He's got yeah. the New Testament. He's got the final word. He's got Jesus. Why does he need that's like all living, that stuff? That's like living in a trailer park. <laughs> you know, yeah, you but, need a foundation for your house. Right. And the Old Testament is the foundation on which the new rests. And nobody sees it more clearly than Pope Benedict. He's done so well with that, yeah. too.
integrate it. But the liturgy than, is what trained him. It wasn't just yeah. the academy. In, right. in the academy, you often have the Old Testament expert or the New Testament specialist, and they isolate their respective spheres. Every the twain shall meet. But right. in the church's liturgy, in the life of prayer, it's always the old and the new, the promises fulfilled in Christ who is there in the Eucharist. Absolutely. I think you can see this too. In one of the in the final chapter of the book, uh, Pope Benedict goes through several of Jesus' titles that he applies to himself. Son of man, the son, and then the other one, which is the most striking of all, I am. Yeah. Thinking about John chapter 8, for example, Jesus is in a debate with the Pharisees and he says to them, before Abraham was, I am. Right. Ego eimi in the Greek. Right, right. Now, if you ignore the Old Testament, right. that seems like a very strange right. statement. You are who? Who yeah, are you? Where does this come from? There's got to be a context. Where's he getting this from? But every first century Jew would have understood that that's an allusion to and, the book of Exodus. And, 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 there, sure. and there's yeah. a sense in which it is uniquely horrifying to the pious Jew because th this is a sacredly terrifying mystery. Sure. The name of God, only God can speak his name. Right. Absolutely. We have this it's not just tetragrammaton, Yahweh, so that we don't have to speak the sacred syllable. It's one of the most terrifying, mystifying, and uh, uh, tremendous events in the Old Testament when God comes to Moses on Mount Sinai and reveals his name and says, I am. Yeah. But what and Jesus takes that name right. and makes it his own. Right, right. And what Pope Benedict does, though, is he, he supplies the middle term because it's not only the revelation of God to Moses at the Exodus, it's also, it's also Isaiah declaring that the, the new Moses will come and bring about a new Exodus, but it won't just be the same. It'll be a new and greater Exodus accomplished not simply by a human Moses, but a new Moses who Isaiah identifies as I am. And so by alluding to, by, by quoting that Isianic oracle, uh, Pope Benedict is showing us that as baffling, as, as shocking as it would have been, it wasn't without precedent. No. The prophets themselves prepared God's people for that which eye had not seen, ear had not heard you, yet. That's absolutely right. You see this again with Jesus' imagery of himself as a shepherd. If you go back and read the book of Ezekiel in chapters 34, 35, and 37, Ezekiel will move between God and the Messiah almost... Uh, Without any distinction, he'll say, the Lord will come and he's going to shepherd his people. He's going to gather his people. But then in the very next breath, he says, the Messiah will come and he will be the shepherd and he will shepherd his people. So is it the Lord or is it the Messiah? And the answer is yes, right? right it's right. both. Yes. It's both and. And yeah. this is what's too much yeah. for contemporary yeah, well, literary why, why critics. Where it? Oh. it must be a difference between the person we're writing about and what he's saying and what is said about him. Let's get yeah. behind the words and find out who he is. That's right. the I mean, it, here, here's challenge. a guy who says, before Abraham was, I am. I'm <laughs> Alpha Omega. I'm, I'm the whole alphabet of being. Now, either he's telling us the truth or he's not. And if he's not, then nobody's interested in Christianity. It, it's all balderdash. But if it's wow. true, then why would one be skeptical about this self-revealing word? You'd want to hear everything. It would awaken this sense of radical Eucharistic wonder. I mean, you mentioned that you introduced this book to students at Notre Dame in a graduate program, and yet some were baffled by it. What, that, that, that to me is astonishing. Well, you know, you ask, why can't people get it? I think we could also ask the question, how in the world did we get it? That, that's <laughs> a very good... That, <laughs> because ultimately, it really is the gift yeah, of faith gift. that it we is. did not deserve or generate on our own natural This powers. is why Jesus' response to Peter is yeah. so important. Because Christ is a scandalon. He yeah. is a stumbling right. block. Yeah. Yeah. And we can trip yeah. over it apart from the grace of the Holy Spirit. So when he yeah. says to Peter, when Peter says, you are the son of the living God, yeah. he says, Peter, flesh and blood has not revealed right. this to you, right. but my Father who is in heaven. So we have to reckon with that as well. All of the pieces of the puzzle can be in place when the old test, from the Old Testament shining light on the new. But at the end of the day, in the final analysis, right. Right. grace has to move in the human heart. As Jesus says, no one comes to me unless the Father draws right. him to right. me. For the oh, 12, as much as the masses, you know, the 12 must have been tempted at times to think we're the in-group, we're the mystery cult. You know, right. we are helping you reach them, but Jesus kept saying, you are them. You know? That's right. We are reaching them, you know, as I am reaching you. And it's the sheer gift of right. grace that Abs Jesus is. Absolutely. And the students that I've worked with this book, who some of whom found it baffling, I think 
were more baffled simply because they've been exposed to so many skeptical scholars right. that see. they've actually, in many ways, and I know this is true in my own life, that for many years I never really read the text in their entirety as a whole completely yeah. because see. scholars were so engaged in taking them yeah. apart, breaking them down, deconstructing them. Right. But yeah. when, you, when you read them as a whole, when you read them in their canonical form and you approach them with a her hermeneutic of trust, faith, but using your reason, but also in light of faith, all of a sudden they come alive in a way that is staggering. staggering. It is startling. But, but what, about, what about simply reading the data of your own heart? Mm. What, what, what Maurice Blondel calls the method of imminence. You look within and you see the hunger and the thirst. You want to be delivered. You want wholeness. You want salvation. And here's a guy who's offering it for free. You right. want this to be true. I mean, even at the level of the subjunctive, I wish this were true. Right, but then we have to always remember that when Christ, if Christ is inaugurating the new Exodus, there's a very great temptation that we face, and it's the temptation that the Israelites face, the desire to go back to Egypt, right? Yep. Remember, yeah. Moses comes yeah. onto the, the flesh scene. Pots. Yeah. That's right, yeah. he sets them free. And, yeah. But they still have this lingering temptation. He's gotten them out of Egypt, but right. it's not quite clear that Egypt has gotten out of them. Right? Right. You know, it's, it's, it's the case that what God has for us in Christ is actually greater than our hearts hunger for. Yeah. Right. And yet it's also much more demanding <laughs> than our wills right. are willing right. to accept. And so the challenge is so great. But yes. I would say, you know, that what Pope Benedict has done is he's really, he's a kind of marriage counselor. He has brought back together what man has torn asunder. Yeah. You know, faith and reason, yeah. the old and the new, yes. scripture and doctrine, exegesis and dogma. You know, it's that marriage of the two that ends up not only being utterly faithful, but as he points out elsewhere, it also ends up, you know, being more scientifically yeah. plausible. It exhibits a greater explanatory power with the text than a merely rational approach can do. He seems to have uh, put a hold on, you don't have to keep exegeting to find another and new meaning for what no. the, the scriptures mean. There's a time when, yes, you've used good exegesis, but you've used the tradition of the church that's and the a, scholars, and we're pulling it together and we anchor here. That's a great point, Father, because one of the unique things about this book is that Benedict will draw on the greatest of the modern scholars, many of them skeptics yeah. at points, but whatever truth he finds yeah. in their writing, he'll use that, and then the next breath he'll be drawing on St. John Chrysostom or St. Augustine or one of the church fathers yeah. from the tradition. And so he, he just, he, see, he looks for the truth and wherever he finds it, he uses it to illuminate the mystery of Christ. Yeah. Well, when we come we back, we're going to ask each panelist to give you a takeaway thought to keep you going in the direction that Pope Benedict has launched us in. Stay with us. In the last 300 years, scholarship has eroded the confidence through its use of various kinds of methods with unfortunate philosophical presuppositions, such as not being able to know the historical Jesus through the Jesus of faith that's presenting in the New Testament. So what Pope Benedict does is he rolls out a little bit of that methodology and shows how that's the case. But his point is not just a critique of method. His point is to show through scholarship and through theological reflection the importance of the witness of Jesus as the divine Son of God. That's what we see in the plain sense reading of the scriptures, and he says we can have confidence in that because that's the reality. Jesus' humanity is entirely intimately linked with the Divine Son, the person of the Divine Son, who is constantly, ever, eternally in the bosom of the Father. You're watching Franciscan University Presents, but you can experience a greater fullness of this message. Our conferences zero right in on strong catechetics that teach you to deepen your faith and to be equipped to go out into the marketplace and stand for the Lord Jesus Christ and His Church. Franciscan University Summer Conferences, 800-437-8368, franciscanconferences.com. We're on our last segment, and this is kind of wrap-up time, takeaway thoughts, and Regis, we usually start with you, and uh, 
How would you put it? I, I'm uh, uh, struck by that one throwaway line in the book where the Pope concedes that here is a product of my free time yes. uh, when I had a spare minute. Uh, <laughs> and I'd, I'd like to know where that spare minute might have been uh, to have made such productive, uh, profound use of, of his leisure is quite, quite astonishing. Uh, George Weigel uh, once said something about uh, this pope, that he was the most self-effacing of men he had ever known, apart from John Paul II, and that nobody gave up more to become the Holy Father than Joseph Ratzinger. Wow. He had all these theological projects he wanted to get to. I, I'd like to know what, what books uh, he needs to write, apart from the wonderful yeah. pile that he has given us, just an astonishingly prodigious pen. And he's a Mozart man. Uh, that's the thing that I like because I love music and I'm particularly drawn to Mozart. That there's, a, there's a purity, a simplicity, a clarity to Mozart. And, and the Pope uh, reminds us that every note, every tone in Mozart fits, belongs. You can't omit a single one or the whole symphony collapses. And, and his own writings have this quality, a kind of architectonic purity, a clarity, and a depth, a luminous depth, which you don't find really in any other uh, living theologian, I, I, I don't think. I mean, I love Balthazar, but there's a density there that, that is difficult, sort of like swimming through wet sand. But with Ratzinger, <laughs> Benedict uh, the Sixteenth, you have this wonderfully uh, pellucid uh, quality that invites a, a, a kind of warmth and excitement. It radiates uh, like the music of most Mozart. And this book uh, has captured it in such a wonderful way. It's infectious. And uh, uh, I, I can't urge people to, to read it uh, uh, enough. Maybe you're giving an insight as to when Cardinal Ratzinger preached at John Paul II's uh, funeral and then it got elected so quickly as yeah. Benedict yeah. College of Cardinals heard something similar right. to what yeah. you've just given us. Yeah. Scott. I think a lot of us sensed that too when they yeah. heard that uh, amazing homily. Uh, for two or three years before I became Catholic in 1986, I was devouring Joseph Ratzinger. I just thought yeah. the lucid, deep yes. beauty of his teaching was just utterly unique. And uh, I, now, after being Catholic for more than two decades, I feel that much more. Uh, I look upon the divine choice. You might say this is residual Calvinism, but I don't think so. This is, this is providence that has brought to us the first German, you know, in, in hundreds of years, but not just any German, arguably the greatest German theologian, man of prayer, you know, Hans Kung, who agrees with him on practically nothing, recognized that this was a man of genius and wow. depth. Wow. And God had prepared him in the 50s, the 60s, and 70s with a doctorate on Augustine, then a second one on Bonaventure, both men of the word, like Ratzinger, like Pope Benedict. And so I, I wanna say it again, though I, I, I risk repeating too often, that what the theology of the body was for John Paul, this will be for Pope Benedict, and I think possibly even more. There's nothing novel or innovative, but what is new about this is the way that he has presented the timeless truths of the faith in such a luminous way, in a way that the scholars can really understand if they will humble themselves and learn from them, yeah. that pastors, deacons, seminarians especially yeah. can profit from. But I would say if you know of anybody who's ever taken a, a college or university class in the New Testament and began to experience the erosion of their faith, or if you did, get this book and watch it. It won't just be reconstructed, it will be transformed. Suddenly the gospels that you'll hear every Sunday will be so deep and so exciting and so wow. alive. I would really say go out and get it and get extra copies for others. Wow, there's a real promotion. Okay. Well, Brent, uh, you've been the scholar in this area and you've blessed us this day. What would you like the viewing audience to take away? I'd like to make at least uh, two points. The first one is that um, for me personally, I went through a long period of skepticism as I was engaged in biblical studies about the Gospels. 
Um, and that I just want to say once more that over time I've realized that the church actually has the most reasonable, the most historical, the most plausible position. That a lot of the skepticism is actually quite irrational and unreasonable when you look at these documents in their historical context, especially the context of first century Judaism. And so I think one of the great benefits of this book is it's calling us back to the historical grounding of Christianity. Because as Benedict says in the first chapter, Christianity is rooted in the Incarnation. We cannot flee from Jesus of Nazareth, from the historical person of Jesus. We have to look at Him in the face, meet Him head on. And in doing so, I think we can do what Father Francis Martin said uh, recently. We are enabled to touch the Word made flesh. I think that's what he's doing in this book. He's enabling us to touch the Word made flesh. But that's the first point, this calling us back to a trust in the Gospels and in the historicity of the Gospels. The second point, uh, this kind of piggybacks on what Scott was just saying, is that I think it's not a coincidence. I don't think it's unintentional at all on Benedict's point, on Benedict's part, to write this particular book at the beginning of his pontificate. Look what he's done now. Since he's been Pope, what was his first encyclical on? God is love, on God, okay. the divine love of God. Okay. Now this great book that he's writing, what is it on? Jesus Christ. I think that Pope Benedict, in the midst of all the confusion, all the suffering, all the turmoil in our world, is calling us as Christians to come back to the very heart, the very center of what it means to be a disciple of Christ, to look at the love of God and to look at the person of Jesus Christ and to really re-encounter Him and ask ourselves as Christians, are we, do we know Him? Are we being disciples of Christ? Can we know Him better and can we love Him more and follow Him more faithfully? And I think that that's what this book is doing. So I would again agree. I would encourage everyone to go out, read it, take it slowly, read it carefully, yes. pray over it, and make it a part of your life because every Christian needs to always re-encounter Christ. And that's what I think that Pope is, Benedict has given us in this book. It's, an, it's his personal journey for the face of the Lord, his search for the face of the Lord. But in doing that, he's unveiled to us a lifetime of research and shown us the face of Christ in a way that's very beautiful, it's very profound, and very challenging. And I'm thankful that he's done this for us. That's very exciting. You know, you have a lot of passion in this, oh, well. which is excellent. <laughs> and uh, so we have for you, just for the asking, a selection by Brant Petrie on uh, Jesus of Nazareth and uh, the analysis here, and we'll mail it to you. and You can get a good taste of his teaching and reading right there. The book, of course, the basic book is this, Jesus of Nazareth by Pope Benedict XVI, and you've seen that. Uh, but key into all this is to absorb it with prayer to know that just as Jesus said, it's not flesh and blood that revealed that to you, Simon Peter, but it's rather the Father in heaven, it's grace. It's a matter of mystery unfolded in grace. So you must pray and you must read the scriptures. Do that along with this good study so that you can be open to all the graces that God wants to give you to know better than ever before in your life and love him ever closer, Jesus of Nazareth. Come see us, register, study online, whatever. But till next time, may the Lord bless and keep you, show his face and your mercy on you, turn his countenance to you and give you his peace. Amen. To receive a free handout on today's topic or to purchase a video of this show, call 888-333-0381. That's 888-333-0381. Or call 740-283-6357. Email your request to presents at franciscan.edu. Or write to Franciscan University Presents, Franciscan University of Steubenville, 1235 University Boulevard, Steubenville, Ohio, 43952.